The biography of the Buddha usually tells the life of Siddhartha Gautama, all the way from his birth, through his renunciation of the royal palace, his enlightenment and propagation of Buddhism, to his Parinibbana. In this presentation of the life of the Buddha, we will focus on the benefits the Buddha brought to the world in his final lifetime, although the benefits he brought during the countless lifetimes as a bodhisattva in his previous lives are not to be forgotten. The life of the Buddha can be studied from many angles, but here we will concentrate on the life of the Buddha as it brought benefit to the world and those around him especially how his teaching and example brought them to the ultimate happiness of Nirvana. In overview, the Buddha brought benefit to the world in three different ways. Benefit to the beings in the world, benefit to his own relatives, and benefit toward Buddhism. We will look in detail at each of the sorts of benefit in turn. The benefits the Buddha brought to the world did not include merely humans and animals, but even beings in realms beyond what the naked eye can see, such as beings in the unfortunate realms, and celestial beings in the fortunate realms. In the weeks immediately after his enlightenment, the Buddha reflected that the truths he had attained were profound, and it would not be every being who could be taught to appreciate those truths in their profundity. Some beings had more capacity to understand the truth about the world than others. The Buddha thus distinguished four different categories of beings, comparing them to four types of lotus. The first group was the lotus blossom above the water. This sort of lotus can be compared to beings with keen faculties whose mental defilements are few. Such beings can swiftly understand the Dhamma as soon as they hear a teaching. These are the beings most quickly able to benefit from the Buddha's teaching. The second group was the lotus blossom at water level. This sort of lotus can be compared to beings with a good disposition, easy to instruct and who can understand the Dhamma after a little clarification. These are the beings who, with a little effort, can benefit from the Buddha's teaching. The third group was the lotus blossom just beneath the water level. This sort of lotus can be compared to beings with little wisdom, who can understand the Buddha's teachings only after a lengthy exposition. These are beings who, with considerable effort, can still benefit from the Buddha's teaching. The last group was the lotus bud still beneath the mud of the river bottom. This sort of lotus can be compared to beings who are dull in their faculties, of bad disposition and difficult to instruct. These are beings who, even with great investment of effort, have hardly any chance to benefit from the Buddha's teaching. In teaching Buddhism, the Buddha focused most of his effort on the first three categories, and as a result, Many were able to benefit from the Dhamma, becoming enlightened in his footsteps. It was these three groups who gave the Buddha the compassion to teach the truth for the benefit of others in the world. The Buddha made his teaching activities part of his daily routine during five regular parts of every day throughout his 45-year dispensation. In the morning, he would go out on alms round every day with his bowl to give common people the opportunity to practice generosity by donating food into his bowl. The alms round activity is said to perpetuate the customs of all the Buddhas, sets a good example for future generations of monks, and gives all lay people, rich or poor, the opportunity to accumulate merit for themselves. Going on alms round, rather than merely waiting for donations of food at the temple, even when the Buddha was aged or ill, is said to demonstrate the great compassion of the Buddha. In the early evening, the Buddha would teach the general public. Wherever the Buddha was in residence, local villagers and people from the neighborhood would come to him in the evening to pay respect and make offerings. The topic of his teaching would often be the progressive sermon, 
which talked about the importance of generosity, self-discipline, the advantages of rebirth in heaven, the harm of sense pleasure, and the benefits of ordination. In expounding the Dharma, the Buddha was more interested in helping the audience attain the stages of enlightenment than in what they had brought to offer him. Indeed, every day members of the public attained the stages of enlightenment in the Buddha's footsteps as a result of his instruction. In the late evening, the Buddha would give teachings to his community of monks on subjects that would lead them to be content with the monastic life and inspire them to train themselves to break free of all suffering like he had done himself. These times would also be the opportunity to clarify any doubts the monks might have in their minds concerning their monastic practice. During the night, the Buddha would answer questions from celestial beings who came to earth from the fortunate realms to seek audience from the Buddha at a time when most people were asleep. Some would ask questions. Some would deliver their own discourses to the Buddha. Some came to listen to the sermons addressed to others. The Buddha would answer their questions or establish them with the Triple Gem as their refuge. Many of the celestial beings coming for audience with the Buddha also attained the stages of enlightenment. This is why, in the chanting in homage to the Buddha, we often find the words, who is teacher of all human and celestial beings. Before dawn, he would meditate to survey the world with his Buddha eye in search of anyone ripe for awakening. In this way, he would know whom his teachings would benefit the most as he went out to teach each day. Sometimes the Buddha's ministry to those who needed his teachings would take him far afield. One example of such ministry was the Buddha intervening to give a teaching to the notorious robber Angulimala before he was able to harm his mother. The Buddha taught in this way throughout the 45 years of his ministry. Even up to the last day of his life, he did not tire of teaching and helped the ascetic Supata to reach enlightenment only hours before he himself entered Parinibbana. The second sort of benefit the Buddha brought to the world was benefit to his own family and relations. His father was King Suddhodana of the city of Kapilavastu, while his mother was Queen Maya of the kingdom of Devadaha. He never forgot his debt of gratitude to the family who had raised him, and repaid the debt of gratitude by instructing his family to the point they too could reach enlightenment or be ordained in his footsteps. Shortly after his enlightenment, he returned to his hometown at the invitation of his father, King Suddhodana. The Buddha visited Kapilavastu with 20,000 monks. Through his teaching, King Suddhodana and his relatives were able to attain the initial stages of enlightenment called stream entry and take the triple gem as their refuge. The next day he instructed his father further in the Dharma to the point his father reached a yet higher stage of enlightenment called the Once Returner. Later, before King Suddhodana passed away, he instructed his father on his deathbed until he could attain full enlightenment and enter Nirvana on his death. He taught Princess Yasodhara, his former wife, explaining to her about how they had pursued perfection side by side for a hundred thousand aeons. All that time ago it had been Yasodhara, who had been his inspiration to do good deeds. Hearing these words, she no longer grieved losing him, but instead was able to attain enlightenment at the level of stream entry. Later, she and almost 100,000 other relatives, ordained as nuns, attained arahantship and entered upon Nirvana. When the Buddha returned to teach Dharma to his relatives, Princess Yasodhara sent their son, the Prince Rahula, to ask for his father's inheritance. The Buddha, however, saw that no wealth could compare with the transcendental inheritance of Nirvana. Therefore, his legacy to Prince Rahula was to allow him to ordain 
as the first ever novice in Buddhism. The Buddha went on to instruct his son until Rahula was able to attain full enlightenment and become the foremost of his disciples in his studies. In addition to this, many of the Buddha's relatives joined the monastic order, some being the foremost amongst the disciples in particular skills, and still known down to the present day for the excellence in propagating Buddhism. One particular example of his concern for his own relatives was to settle a dispute between rival factions of his own family. In those days, the kingdom of his father's side of the family, Kapilavastu, and of his mother, Devadaha, were separated by a river. The river was called Rohini. People from both kingdoms had to share the river as their main water source. During a drought, river water became so scarce that the quarrels over water became violent to the point that the army had to be called in on both sides of the river. The Buddha realized he could prevent dispute and bloodshed, so he went to that place on the river and admonished them to see the importance of love between relatives, saying friendship should be thicker than blood. He asked them whether drinking water was more precious than each other's blood, and when they agreed it was not, they came to their senses and settled the dispute over water in a peaceful way. On another occasion there was a quarrel between his relatives and the prince of Kosala. Since his relatives, the Sakyas, looked down on a certain prince Vitutapa of Kosala on account of his imperfect provenance, as soon as he ascended to the throne of Kosala, he marched against the Sakya kingdom. The Buddha intervened, waiting for the approaching Kosalan army beneath a leafless tree. When Vitutapa saw the Buddha, he paid respect to him. The Buddha taught him that the refreshing shade of a tree ought to be like the love between relatives. The prince realized the Buddha's message and ordered his army to retreat instead of proceeding with the conflict. The third sort of benefit which the Buddha brought to the world were his duties in establishing Buddhism. After his enlightenment, the Buddha realized that establishing Buddhism meant both spiritual work on himself and laying down the system by which Buddhism could continue to prosper as his legacy. Even though enlightened, the Buddha continued the spiritual work on himself by meditating in solitude frequently, sometimes for seven days at a time, sometimes for fifteen days according to the circumstances. His example shows that although he did a lot to serve and benefit society, he never forgot his commitment to do spiritual work on himself too. For the benefit of others, he set in motion the wheel of the Dharma, establishing Buddhism, and laid down the means by which it could be perpetuated before he passed away. In the beginning of his dispensation, he ordained his monastic disciples in person. Later, he delegated his authority for enlarging Buddhism, allowing elder monks to ordain monks and novices themselves. Because he had a long-term vision of Buddhism extending beyond his own death, he laid down the structures so that monks could look after themselves, and the teachings and disciplines he left behind could overcome the doubts of monks even in his absence. He established a system of seniority for monks, whereby those ordaining earlier should be respected by those who ordained later. As the elder monks took responsibility for teaching their juniors, their juniors would take responsibility to care for and support their elders. Furthermore, the Buddha recognized the important roles of the four different sectors of the Buddhist community, the monks, nuns, laymen and laywomen. Monks had the duty not only to train themselves, but also to protect and spread the Buddhist teachings, instructing the nuns, laymen and laywomen. Unfortunately, the community of nuns does not exist anymore in the traditional sense. However, for laymen and laywomen it was clear that the Buddha meant 
that they too should cultivate perfections through generosity, keeping the precepts and meditation, while giving their support to the community of monks in terms of the four requisites, while protecting the monks in case of danger. All these structures laid down by the Buddha are expressions of the Buddha's responsibility for the perpetuation of Buddhism.